I'm, I'm, uh, I'm so pleased to see you. I'm pleased to see your body language. You look very sort of smooth. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit, but I, I want to say something about food design first. Uh, so uh, at this conference, uh, fundamentally, obviously, if people have to travel from different countries to physically meet, that's not environmentally optimal. There's a, there's a footprint that comes with that. And we believe, because we believe in the value of the physical meeting and these informal spaces where we can also talk, it means that, that, uh, that we believe that that's a trade-off that if you work with physical events, certainly, we must all believe that that's worth making. But then that means that that, that adds some extra pressure on thinking about the environment. And of course, that's why we have uh, this experiment running for the third year in the row now, where we flip the script on vegetarian food and, and meat. We are, most of us are meat eaters of the organizers, so it's not about that. We just think that in this society we eat maybe too much meat, like more than we need and more than, than we can afford on a planetary level. So normally when you go to an event, the norm is that there's going to be meat on the menu, and then if you want a vegetarian option, you sign up for that. And I think a lot of people who, who like vegetarian food don't ever sign up for that option because they know that that food is going to be like a very disappointing risotto. And then they too, they're probably going to have like potatoes with sauce. Um, and then, then you make that choice. And, and we felt that we want to send a signal that, that we kind of promise that you're going to have food that is satisfying even though you make that choice. And also because I think that out of the people who, who can eat either, they're never going to make the extra effort to select a less satisfying option out of some like vague envir environmental worry. But on the other hand, we feel like if you want to eat meat, that's also totally fine. So that's why we we've established this idea that the norm is that you get vegetarian food and then you just send the email if you want the meat and you'll get some. Uh, and this is interesting in so many ways. Uh, one of the interesting effects of this is that a relatively low percentage, uh, never more than 30%, ask for the meat, even though we know that on the, it, it would be the other way around. Uh, if, um, if, we did it, uh, if, if we did it the normal way. Uh, that's very good organizing practice also in the sense that vegetarian food tends to be cheaper also, so you can, you can negotiate a better deal with your caterers. Um, I mean, we're all in some way making these things, so let's talk about this openly. That's one of the ways that we can keep the ticket price uh, relatively low for this kind of a, an event. However, there are some interesting consequences of this. So the first year, I mean, we love Eric Storps Kungsgård. Did you have a good dinner last night? Yes. Uh, they're very skilled, right? Very, very skilled. And they're all organic and local, and they like this stuff, and they make great vegetarian food. They also make great meat. And there is just something in the institutional organization of a, of a restaurant that makes, even a very good restaurant, that makes this so difficult to handle. So the first year, uh, they, because of some kind of weird, like, oh, it would be practical, they put all the people who had chosen the meat option in the same room, like a separate chambre separée for the meat eaters, or the meat ghetto, as we call it. And when you walked into the meat ghetto, it was like 13 Danish men and one pregnant Norwegian woman. So the social dynamic in that room became very strange, especially when the other participants came in and were like, started to take pictures of them. Oh my God, <laughs> this is what meat eaters look like. <laughs> so second year, we had like a big negotiation with Eric Starp, like, okay, so we okayed that plan. That wasn't a great plan, so we need to think again. And we resolved it. So what happens normally when you go to a restaurant is, with a big company. They figure out who are the vegetarians and then they get vegetarian food, right? But weirdly, this, they can't flip this. So yesterday, many tables containing meat eaters, we find, got no meat at all. Some tables had plenty of meat, so clearly the, there was some method. Did anyone have meat yesterday? Could, could somebody, yeah. How did you get the meat? Did you ask for it or was it brought to you? You asked for it, that's right. So, so they didn't have, like, they would never make a mistake like this with the vegetarians, right? So, so when you do surprising things, you have to make, you have to take responsibility for, in some way, other people's jobs, right? And I think that this is a good reminder uh, of how this stuff works. We, th we still think this is fundamentally sound design. There's a nudge design element to this. It's just like, it's a little bit too annoying to send that email, you know? And many of you who, who maybe would have, if it would have been easier, would have chosen meat, chose not to eat meat because of this reason. But of course, the intention is still that everybody who makes that choice actually gets the meat. So I apologize for this, for this mess up. This is, it's still, of course, it's always our responsibility. Um, and uh, 
but there's a design lesson in it, positive and negative ones. All right. Um, and now we're all here. Uh, we can. Uh, I'm gonna do a little. Um, I'm gonna do a little like mini talk uh, about some other things now that we're all like we've leveled up since yesterday morning. It feels like yesterday morning was a really long time ago. So I'm gonna recap a little bit of what I said yesterday, and then I'm gonna talk about two additional things. Um, user journeys, we can say, and Arctic participation design. So yesterday I talked a, uh, quite a bit about this, about the magic circle and about designing for that and that fundamentally designing for that just as when you do anything with humans is that you have to try and remember that what you're dealing with is humans and not some kind of ideal uh, idea of what um, of, of the ideal abstract participant. But now maybe you don't know any humans uh, and then you, might, you may need like a checklist and there's this model, everybody knows this, I think, called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. Uh, it's, a, it's a simplification in some ways, but it's very useful to remember. So just to recap, physiological level, these are sort of in order of importance. This needs to be in place for the next thing to happen and so on. So you have food, water, shelter, warmth, and let's put bathrooms there as well. If your participants are, need to go to the bathroom, they will not go to the talk. Like That's just the way it is. So that needs to be in place first. Then you have safety, belonging, self-esteem, and self-actualization. So up there, on the top level, you have things like creativity and fulfillment. So when you're designing transformative events, of course, you kind of want your participants to be up there, at least some of the time. And that means that you have to take responsibility uh, for enabling all of these other things to work. And fundamentally, what I talked about yesterday with the physical and the social spaces, was plenty of things uh, that you can check up again on the internet after, but let's just say the what kinds of things can happen in this place and who can I as a participant be where those kinds of things are happening are the sort of core questions. But that's especially for what happens sort of inside the magic circle, but to get people to actually come to your thing or participate in the thing that you're trying to do, uh, of course the journey is, is longer than that, so, so actually the, the idea of the magic circle is a bit of a simplification because it, there are many levels of magic circles inside each other. Uh, if you design a beautiful bathroom at your event, that's a little tiny magic circle inside the magic circle and so on, because that's a very separate type of experience than what's happening in this room. Um, but also what's happening before, so for instance, how do you select for, how do the people choose to go? So you also have to design for what happens before they even come. Expectation phase, right? The experience before stepping into the magic circle. So this is from the first time they ever hear about or become aware of the thing that you're trying to do to the point when they actually enter the experience. All of that is also in your domain. And this is the level where disappointments happen. What happens here is what controls whether the thing that they experience is disappointing or maybe it's overwhelming or, you know, you come in with a certain set of, of baggage that you, that you might want to organize to be able to work with it, to prime people to, to behave in certain ways, but also because, because of this. If you tell them it's going to be a party at a castle and they show up at, at, an, at an office at Roskilde University, they're probably going to be quite disappointment, disappointed. Uh, so expectation management. Uh, is a term uh, that you need to keep in mind. This is what we're doing. And this is, of course, why integrated messages are so important. The visual look and the, and the tone of voice, all of these things that we know from traditional advertising and so on, uh, they haven't disappeared just because we're making other kinds of things now. And there's a very practical test that I always do, especially when I talk, um, uh, teach with the museum sector. Uh, we call the first five test. And as you walk to the entrance, you, you, you leave the building from the, from the staff door, if, you, if, you work, if this is a place where you work often, and you walk around to the front, to the main entrance, and then you pretend that you have never been there before, and you step into your building as a participant or a visitor, and you look at what happens. First five meters, first five seconds. What do I see? How does it feel? What am I experiencing? The results of this test are often terribly bad, horrific, because we all know so much about this thing. So we assume that, of course, everybody will understand where they should go and whether it's free or not, and where they should put their coat. Uh, if you've ever entered an airport, you know the same thing. There, the scale is larger than it's the first 15. And I think if you're designing something very weird, like a very weird 
uh, very weird experience, then maybe it's not five seconds, maybe it's five minutes or even 15 minutes. Like the first 15 minutes, people are just going to figure out what the hell is going on. So you can't challenge them very much there. You, they need to become safe, they like, need to understand what's happening and what the codes are and what they're, what's expected of them before they can move into the experience. And then on the other side of the experience, we have the same thing. We have the reflection phase. And I said before that every participant makes their own story, but they're not making it so much while it's actually happening, because then it's still being negotiated. They make the story after the thing has ended. So, of course, this phase is when, if it's a learning experience, teaching experience, that's when the learning happens, but this is also where, where the story that you tell yourself and others about what you've experienced um, becomes real. And, um, and this is also especially important because if you're working with small budgets or small teams or, or volunteers, you probably, like, but when you've packed up the last scenography, you're dead. Like, you have nothing left to give. So whatever's going to happen here probably needs to be planned a lot earlier, or at least make like an active decision that, that, that you're not going to follow up so much. So like, for instance, after this day, you're probably going to have a newsletter from us, and we're going to try and, and blog more actively, because you might be more interested in these things right now, and we're going to ask some of you to guest blog. But otherwise, like, what we have is pretty much the Facebook page, so you can find each other. And that's not a bad thing, because people are also very good at, at making their own after experience, right? Uh, but if you're making something uh, ambitious with a goal to, for instance, impact society or change people's lives, you need to design what happens after as well. This is slightly different, because this is more of a professional setting. Then uh, I want to just run through something real quick that uh, Andy Nordgren talked about on this stage uh, at the end of last conference. And the whole talk is available on the website and you should absolutely see it. It's probably the best 20 minutes you're going to spend this year. But I'm going to just recap the main point because this is really important. So most organizations and companies are operating on this, this level, the product level of focus and communication. We have a cool product, look at us. We have this thing that we would want you to buy or do or experience. Or even worse, if you're, for instance, in the public sector, we have something that you desperately need, no one else has it. Look at us. Healthcare. Uh, so, so we're in a shift now in, in the business world where we're moving to sort of the next level where people are thinking about these user journeys and saying, hey, like the audience is important, the customer is important, let's look, customer service, really important, let's look at that perspective. And we move to the next level where the message is more like, help us show you, show you our cool stuff. Oh, we can communicate in social media, that's interesting. Then we can collaborate about the narrative of this product that we have. But the, and, you know, and I think if you're here, you need to get here. But when you're here, don't stop there, because what we're all interested in doing, most of that happens over here on the participant level. Third level engagement, right? So then suddenly you have to take your institutional ego and say, wait a minute, maybe it's not about how cool I am or how cool we are, maybe it's about the participant's experience. And then the message needs to be the meeting with you, you the participant, you the audience, you the customer, you the citizen, that's what makes our stuff cool. And cool can mean important or beautiful. I mean, if you're providing healthcare, the importance of that isn't that like doctors are important or, or that we have a, a specific system for managing like schedules in the, in the hospital, it's that the, the patient is happy and safe, right? So if you want to test what level you're on, you go online and you check social media for people who are talking about your thing. They talk about your thing, about your product, Level one, they talk about the, their experience with you. Level two, they talk about themselves. Level three. So what could an example of that look like? Product level. I mean, let's think about praise. Like, What is the positive outcome? Because, of course, you can get really great feedback on this level. Maybe you're, you've just built Gardner Moore or whatever, and people are going like, this is a beautiful airport. That's a very positive feedback, and you're, you should be happy because it's probably a beautiful airport, but you're still on level one. Check-in and security were really smooth and fast today. Participant talks about their experience. Very good, very good feedback on level two. But if you get people who are physically at your airport and what they, what they post has nothing to do with your airport, they say, I love to travel, then you're on the participant level, you see. And of course, now this is a very sort of inane example, just to make it really clear, but you have to think about what are the equivalents for the thing that you want to do? How do you make it about them and not about you? 
Um, so, so Andy talks about leaving institutional uh, ego behind. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't take pride in your work. What we do is amazing. It's really cool. But it's not ultimately for us. Um, we should be proud about the craft and we should be proud about the work, but the less people think about it, the better it is. Right? Um, so design for the participant, design with the participant as much as possible, and the way to do that ultimately is be the participant. And uh, that is that. Thank you. Look. <laughs>